New car, for the price of a second-hand one, is always a tempting prospect, and when it's as smartly styled and capable as Dacia's Duster, the concept becomes particularly appealing. Undercutting rival models in the small SUV segment by an enormous amount, this Romanian budget brand uses proven Renault engineering to create a very likeable product that could prove ideal as backup family transport. This second generation version gets more technology and a bit of extra polish, but otherwise the basic recipe is pretty much unchanged. Dig down the back of the sofa for some money and join the queue to buy one. The Duster is the car that epitomizes Dacia, the Renault-owned Romanian brand who have brought a whole new value perspective to family cars since their launch in our market back in 2012. The original version of this model was astonishingly well-priced, but it felt it in some aspects of its design. With a few of the rough edges smoothed off though, this second generation car could be a very competitive proposition indeed. There's nothing radically different on offer this time around, but at the same time, almost everything's been changed, or so Dacia says anyway. Uh, the reality is that the B0 series platform and a lot of the engineering that you can't see is much the same as it was before, but it is true that every exterior panel is new. The driver experience should be much better too. The brand boldly promises that refinement is almost twice as good. Plus there's extra four wheel drive functionality and you get a proper electric power steering system to replace the pond old hydraulic setup. Best of all, perhaps, we're promised that the cabin will no longer have the feel of an Armenian thrift store. And you can now option it up with sophisticated features foreign to the Dacia brand in the past, like climate control, keyless entry, and a multi-view rear camera. But you could argue that to do that would be to dilute this car's most unique selling point, its value proposition. Despite its smarter presentation this time around though, the Duster remains, in its maker's words, shockingly affordable, priced at 25% or more less than most comparable rivals. Which would be irrelevant if cheap also meant nasty, but it doesn't, it can't. Dacia knows that the opposition can't get near its pricing, but it's also aware that if the quality and the execution of this product isn't up to snuff, many potential buyers will rightly see a comparably priced second-hand late low mileage small SUV as a better bet. So will that be true? Or is our market's most affordable SUV as impressive in practice as it is in price? Let's find out. Cut back on cost and you also tend to cut back on expectations. Now yours might not be particularly high when taking to the road in this Romanian built, French engineered little SUV, in which case you might be pleasantly surprised in many ways by what's on offer here. If you have experience of the previous Duster model, or even if you haven't, then there are two things that you're likely to initially notice on the test drive. Now, the first thing that impresses itself on you is the steering. This time around, it's a modern electrically assisted setup, which is vastly better than the vague old hydraulic system used previously. It is rather light and a bit devoid of much feedback, but it makes the car much easier to maneuver in tight spots than it was before. And at highway speeds, it delivers less play than the old rack, and therefore makes the car feel safer and more planted on the road. The second and equally important change here relates to refinement. Now it's a measure of what a noisy old thing the previous Duster was that Dacia can claim a 50% reduction in interior noise this time around. Now we're not sure that the improvement is that great, but this car is certainly much more refined in second generation form. Thanks, so its maker says, to thicker front window glass, improved sealants, and a 30% increase in the number of sound absorbent surfaces in the cabin. As a result, around town, it's just as refined as any pricey little SUV would be. Uh, you can't say the same though at highway speeds where there is a fair bit of wind noise from the mirrors and the roof rails together with road noise through the floor but it's still a massive improvement on what was offered up before and you'll now never need to shout to communicate with those in the rear.
As for drive dynamics, well, criticising this car for not being fun to drive is about as relevant as moaning about the lack of boot space in a Ferrari, so we won't bother to do that. It's fine for its intended audience, with decent grip and fairly soft suspension, which does contribute a fair amount to cornering lean at speed, but which sends fewer shocks into the cabin over severe bumps than was the case with the previous model. Uh, now, that's about as much as we could have hoped for, given that this second generation Duster's platform remains the same basic B0 chassis that was used by its predecessor and those are underpinnings that date all the way back to the third generation Renault Clio of 2005. There are actually two suspension setups in play here and both appropriately are fairly rudimentary by modern standards. This car has to tackle the unsealed roads of undeveloped nations like Morocco and Iran, so there would be no point in giving it fancy modern multi-link mechanicals. Uh, the two-wheel drive variants get a strengthened version of the same McPherson strut type arrangement that's used in Dutch's Logan and Sandero models. Go for four-wheel drive, something that, remember, relatively few small SUVs actually offer and and there's a more sophisticated multi-arm arrangement. You'll be wanting to know about engines, which haven't changed at all from those used in the final versions of the previous model, and that means that Dacia unfortunately hasn't been able to persuade Renault to release one of its modern turbocharged TCE petrol power plants for this car. So Duster buyers wanting to fuel from the green pump are forced to persevere with the rather wheezy, normally aspirated 1.6 litre SCE unit that we're trying here. With 115 horsepower to play with, this rather old tech lump has about the right sort of output for a car of this kind, but without a turbo to boost it along a bit, there's a notable lack of grunt through the gears, thanks to the modest 156 newton meter torque output. From rest, the 62 miles an hour sprint occupies 11.9 seconds en route to 107 miles an hour. Those are figures that fall to 12.9 seconds and 105 mph if you go for four-wheel drive. It's better than if funds permit to pay the significant premium required for the 1.5 litre blue DCI diesel unit. Here there's also a 115 horsepower output with almost 70% more turbo torque to push you down the road. The diesel feels uh, significantly faster inevitably. Much more so in fact than the basic performance stats suggest. For the two wheel drive model the C62 MPH reached in 10.5 seconds on the way to 111 miles an hour. That's if you're quick with your shift changes. The petrol front driven model uses five five-speed manual transmission, but the other variants get a six-speed manual as standard. Uh, that includes all the diesels. Uh, you'll certainly want a DCI duster if you're planning to do some towing. This variant has a useful brake towing capacity of up to 1.5 tonnes. Now, earlier we mentioned four-wheel drive, and that's an option well worth considering, and one well suited to this Duster's uh, robust remit. The Dacia talks of extra four-wheel drive functionality this time around, but that mainly relates to the addition of a 4x4 monitor with various useful readouts that you can access on this Mark II model's centre dash screen. These include a compass and information on vehicle angles. On the top Prestige variant, this media nav display also includes a multi-view camera system, and that shows you the area directly around the vehicle, that's a real boon when you're manoeuvring off-road. The actual mechanical four-wheel drive hardware though is pretty much as it was before, a Nissan engineered three-mode system and that's selectable via a rotary controller in front of the gear stick. Most of the time you'll be in two-wheel drive but on slippery terrain there's a peace of mind of uh, being able to uh, switch seamlessly into auto so that extra traction will automatically cut in when necessary. For severe mud plugging meanwhile you want to keep all the wheels turning permanently by switching to the lock setting. It's in these kinds of conditions that you'll appreciate the hill descent control and hill start assist systems which will make driving easier on sloping surfaces and the useful 210mm of ground clearance that facilitates a 350mm wading depth and also the impressive clearance angles, 30 degrees of approach and 33 degrees of departure. The latter figure is down from 35 degrees previously but it's all still enough to make quite a few allegedly more serious 4x4s look a bit self-conscious.
Until a few years ago, most of the cars selling in this model segment weren't called SUVs in the way they are today. Instead, we labelled them crossovers, and that's an industry term designating a ruggedized SUV style hatchback. With the Duster, though, uh, there's never been that ambiguity. It's always been an SUV in its approach, in its driving dynamics, and in the way that it looks. And that's one of the things which customers of the earlier version liked most about it. In redesigning this car, uh, the Romanian brand could have followed rivals and made this car a bit more bling, but thankfully they haven't. Every body panel has changed though to make it smarter, smoother and more modern, but it's still very much a sensible, no-nonsense, compact sports utility vehicle. Now, to some extent, this design continuity was heavily influenced by the fact that this second generation model has to ride on the same B0 platform as its predecessor, and it uses the same wheelbase and a lot of the same mechanicals. There's also the same ride height as before, which sees this car raised 210 millimeters from the deck. That's an almost unheard of height in the small SUV segment. Uh, further design cues are also carried over. A glass house, which is shallower than that of some rivals, a uh, kicked up rear window line and a wheelbase that appears longer than it is. But there are changes too. Uh, the previous curious crescent style crease that flowed between the chunky wheel arches is replaced here by more conventional smooth chamfered surfacing and by this sharp swage line just above the sills. Uh, potentially you can specify wheels of up to 17 inches in size. These branded roof rails are neat and there's now this black vertical trimming panel just behind the front wheel arch which is intended to make the profile look a bit more perfect purposeful. At the front, the rather apologetic look of the original model makes way for something much more modern. Uh, the windscreen has been brought forward 100 millimeters and it's more steeply raked, while below it, the redesigned bonnet features crease lines intended to make the car look more rugged. And the front skid plate no longer looks like an afterthought, but an integral part of the front end, flowing up towards this smarter grille with a satin chrome finish on the plusher variants. Uh, the three section LED daytime running lights are neat too. At the back, Dacia is debuting its latest rear lighting signature, four stacked red squares. Now the lamps look quite smart, but they're virtually an exact copy of those on the Jeep Renegade, which is rather disappointingly derivative. Uh, as at the front, the scratch resistant skid plate is more overt this time around, and this dark tinted glass is standard further up the range. In short, it's all pretty smart. If you draw up in one of these, is anyone really gonna think that you've paid up to half as much as you might have done for a car of this kind? We don't think so. In the original model though, you were reminded in no uncertain terms how little you'd paid once you took a seat inside the cheap low rent cabin. So it's time to see whether Dacia has significantly improved it. The front doors are tall and wide, so getting in is easy. And once inside, well, you do still know you're in a budget brand model, but it is a vast improvement over what was offered up before. Now, the central console no longer looks like something from the last century, and now incorporates three smart central vents and a higher set screen for the media nav infotainment display that you get on the plusher models. Uh, perhaps most notably though, the dash plastics are no longer shiny and cheap. Now apparently it's all about the grain in the plastic molding, which has been refined by 80%. Whatever the reason, Reason, the finish is no longer something that you need to feel in any way embarrassed about. Yes, there are a few things. Uh, the door handle pulls, for example, that still let the side down a little when it comes to quality, but otherwise, most of the areas that you're likely to regularly touch, uh, the door armrests and the chunky gear lever, for instance, now feel good. Plus, as before, the Duster's cabin has a solid, built-to-last feel, and everything seems to have been decently screwed together by the Romanian factory. If you happen to have experience of the previous model, you'll also immediately notice the slightly airier feel, thanks to the way that the windscreen's been moved forward by 100 millimeters. And the seats, as before, they are SUV-like in their raised positioning. Not all cars in this class actually offer that, but this time around, they're vastly more comfortable. Uh, the previous ones offered all the support of a park bench, but, but these chairs use denser, more enveloping foam with extra lateral bolstering for the turns and front cushions that are 20 millimeters longer, and that makes all the difference when it comes to long drives. Uh, avoid the really basic models and you'll find features like an armrest and a height adjustment function, which now offers 20 millimeters more travel. 
The four-spoke steering wheel has been redesigned too and it finally integrates a horn, although it still looks a bit down market unless you can stretch to this comfort spec, which point it gets softer finishing along with chrome and charcoal trimming. Reach and rake adjustment uh, is standard across the range. Through the spokes, you view a revised set of clearly designated instrument dials, which is separated by a black and white information screen that in top spec models gives you average and current fuel consumption, a driving range, a digital speedometer, engine temperature and tyre pressures. Pretty much anything that this can't tell you will probably be covered by the center dash media nav infotainment display that you'll get providing you can avoid the two base trim levels. This is a seven inch color touch screen that has navigation along with a special traffic messaging channel built in. And it also gives you radio, media and phone functions plus a driving eco two section with tips for extra frugality. There's a USB port built into the frame too, although that's not really the right place for this to be. It means that when you're connected up, wires will probably be dangling down across the display. Uh, a neat row of piano style switches sits below this monitor, although even in this plush model, there are plenty of blanked out buttons. And storage capacity, well, Dacia says that around the cabin, this has been increased by 20% to 28.6 litres. That's despite the fact that the glove box, which includes a separate internal shelf, is severely compromised in size, and there's still no stowage box between the seats. On the plus side, the door pockets are reasonably shaped, and there's a narrow storage slot alongside the handbrake here, uh, and a rather useless one, actually, just above the glove box. Uh, you don't get anywhere to store your sunglasses, but there is a shallow compartment uh, which incorporates a cup holder just ahead of the gear stick uh, with a 12 volt socket nearby. Two more cup holders uh, sit further back between the seats and there's also a coin cubby below the gear stick and a ticket clip which is incorporated as part of the driver's vanity mirror. Uh, further up the range, two wheel drive models get a draw beneath the front passenger seat too. What else? Um, well, thanks to this raised driving position and the large glass area, forward vision is fine, but your rear three quarter view is a bit limited by the upswept rear windows and the thick pillars. That might be an issue if you can't stretch beyond the first two trim levels, which don't include parking sensors, even as an option. Beyond that level in the range, those come as standard along with the rear view camera. Uh, we would like to have seen a bit more space to the left of the clutch pedal to rest your left foot on. Uh, because that's lacking here, it's usually necessary to drive this car with your left foot drawn further back than your right one. Right, time to take a seat in the rear. Now the fact that like its predecessor, this dust is so much larger than the class norm ought to help enormously here. Uh, now to give you some perspective on that, it's 219 mils longer than a Renault Capture and 206 mils longer than a Nissan Juke. And that's a pretty big margin of metalwork. Again, the tall door opening makes access easy, which will be a boon if you're trying to get car seats in and out. Once inside, you'll really feel the benefits of that extra body length if you tried other typical models in this segment. There's a bit more width on the class average too, uh, enough in fact to allow the fitment of three child seats should that be required. Uh, if your kids are slightly older, they'll be fine back here and we think they will appreciate the low set window line on longer journeys. As is inevitable and always the case with a car in this class, three adults will feel far less comfortable, although the relatively low centre transmission tunnel and the generous headroom means that they'll cope okay on shorter trips. Uh, door bins feature for the first time with this second generation design and there's easy access to the two cup holders provided between the seats ahead. Uh, the upholstery feels like it'll be particularly durable and useful pockets feature in both seat backs. Finally, let's check out the boot, which also benefits from this Duster's generous exterior sizing. Now, most cars in this class give you uh, 350 to 400 litres of trunk space. Here you get 445 litres in a front-driven model like this one. Unfortunately, thanks to different suspension design with the four-wheel drive Duster model, that falls to a rather less competitive 376 litres, although this does take into account the fitment of a spare wheel, something that the two-wheel drive variants unfortunately have to do without. There's certainly enough room in here to cater for a fortnight's worth of holiday luggage, a really large fold-out buggy or a rather indulgently sized family supermarket visit. 
The trunk area itself is wide, high and practically sized with only a small lip to lift stuff over. You get a couple of bag hooks and four tie down points but no underfloor storage. Uh, signs of cost cutting are there if you look for them. This carpet isn't properly fastened down and with entry level trim you don't get a split folding rear passenger bench. That is standard here although the seat back doesn't drop flat and this you go round to the passenger compartment and first pull up the seat base which is a massive faff. Um, Need little slots by the rear doors keep the belt buckles out of the way when you push the seat backrest forward though. Uh, with everything flat there's 1623 litres of fresh air on offer in this front driven version or 1559 litres in the four wheel drive version. While the prospect of owning a trendy, compact SUV-style model for less than £10,000 might be the thing that gets people into Dacia showrooms, the car that satisfied prospective buyers end up driving out of them will probably require a very differently sized check. Still one, though, that'll offer a considerable saving on comparable models from other brands. Now the reason why becomes clear when you take a closer look at what's on offer. The baseline 10k price applies to an access specification duster that hardly anyone buys because it really is basic. You may not care that it can only be ordered in petrol form, but you might well object to the fact that it doesn't even have a radio and not many other creature comforts either. Now we'll get to the exact specifications in a minute, but suffice to say that there is a reason why almost all duster buyers start their range perusal one up from the base trim level, which means a starting price price of just under £12,000 for the essential variant in question. Here we've opted for mid-range comfort spec, which priced from not much more than £13,000 gives you a few extra niceties. And even if you go for the fanciest prestige model, you can have one of those for well under £15,000. It all represents pretty impressive value. How does Dutcher manage it? Well, it's a combination of a couple of things. Firstly, there's the fact that around 50% of the components used here are carryovers from Renault models, mostly older ones. Uh, Duster runs, for example, on the B0 series platform of a previous generation Clio Super Mini, so there's very little engineering cost to build into the purchase price. And secondly, there's the fact that this model, uh, like the other Dachas, is assembled using low-cost labour at the company's Petesti plant in Romania, plus it's also made in Curitiba in Brazil and at the Aftoframos plant in Moscow, Russia. Back to the range structure. Now those three main duster trim levels, essential, comfort and prestige, each give buyers all the main mechanical options. Either a 1.6 litre SCE 115 HP petrol power plant, or for 2,000 pounds more, a much more frugal 1.5 litre blue DCI 115 HP diesel unit. We've got the petrol unit here. Either way, your starting point lies with two wheel drive, but for 2,000 pounds more, you can specify a four wheel drive model. Transmission wise, you get a five speed manual gear box with a petrol two-wheel drive model, all other variants get a six-speed manual standard. Now you can talk to your dealer about the possibility of an EDC automatic gearbox option and there are no other engine choices. So let's try to put the value proposition into some kind of perspective. Even the value brand models, which represent this Thatcher's uh, most obvious competition, struggle to get close to duster pricing. Uh, the most basic MG ZS that you can buy costs around £12,500, and you'll need £1,000 to £1,500 more than that if you want something like a Sangyong Tivoli or a basic SUV transport option like Suzuki's Jimny. So what about the more established mainstream products in the small SUV segment? Well, against these, this Romanian contender looks very affordable indeed. Uh, the Renault product in this sector, which shares some of this duster's engineering, uh, the Capture, is priced from around £15,500, as is its Renault Alliance cousin, the Nissan Duke. And if you get a Capture or a Duke with much the same 1.5 litre DCI diesel engine that's offered in the duster, you'll pay well over three to £4,000 more for the privilege. On top of that, both the Capture and the Duke are among the more affordable small SUVs in the small crossover segment and they're priced equivalently to cars like Fiat's 500X and Citroen's C3 Aircross. 
Look at the other popular options on offer in this class. Uh, cars like Seat's Arona, Ford's Echo Sport, uh, Mazda CX-3, Vauxhall's Crossland X, Kia's Stonic, Hyundai's Kona, Suzuki's Vitara, and Peugeot's 2008. And you're likely to end up paying somewhere in the 18 to 20,000 pound bracket, which if you think about it, is an awful lot of money to pay for a car in this class, especially when it gets you a car that's not as tough or as spacious or as durable as this one, and which in most cases can't be ordered with four wheel drive. Of course, what the extra money gets you with those rivals is smarter looks, more car-like driving dynamics, and classier interior design. You'll just have to decide whether those things really are worth so much more. If, understandably, you conclude that a duster makes much more sense, then you're going to need to know just how much kit Dacia is throwing in as part of its so-called shockingly affordable pricing. Well, let's see. Now, we've already referenced the fact that no nonsense access starter trim really is very basic, but to be fair, you do get powered front windows, uh, remote locking, daytime running lights, and an engine stop-start system. As we've said, though, uh, a more common starting point for perusal of the range is with the next spec level up. That's essential trim. Now that gives you much less of a bargain basement look. That's courtesy of body coloured bumpers, uh, smarter Fiji 16-inch uh, steel wheels, black roof bars and front fog lamps. Plus inside you get air conditioning, a height adjustable driver's seat, a 60-40 split folding rear seat back, uh, Bluetooth phone connectivity and USB and aux in connection points. Praise be, you get a radio too and it's even got an incorporated DAB tuner. Here though, we've opted for the mid-level comfort trim, which is the one the majority of Duster customers choose, and that's identifiable by its 16-inch Cyclade alloy wheels, its extra tinted rear windows, and the satin chrome trim applied to the side sills, the door mirrors, uh, the roof bars, and the front and rear skid plates. Inside, the main addition at this level is the 7-inch Media Nav Center Dash infotainment screen, which features uh, navigation, voice control, and traffic information. Plus, there's a rear view camera, a seven-function trip computer, cruise control, Control, powered heated mirrors and electric rear windows. And that doesn't leave all that much for the flagship prestige version to include, except a larger 17 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, climate control for the first time in a duster, keyless entry, a wider ranging multi view rear camera, and special prestige upholstery. As for options, uh, well, for mainstream models, there are only two, and it's quite possible that you're going to want both of them. Metallic paint, uh, here we've got desert orange, and an emergency spare wheel on the front-driven versions. A spare does come as standard if you go for the 4x4 duster. Go for top prestige trim, and you can also have a Western European mapping upgrade for the sat-nav, and even leather upholstery with heated front seats. That all seems a bit extravagant on a Dacia. You can, of course, also add the usual lifestyle items, tow bars, roof boxes, roof rails, and a dog guard. So, has Dacia cut important corners to make this car so affordable? In safety, perhaps? Well, let's see. Now, the brand says that this second-generation model is a safer car than its predecessor, pointing to the fact that the overall vehicle frame has been reinforced. Apart from that, the only significant across-the-range spec change in this regard lies with the welcome addition of curtain airbags to join the twin front and side bags, which all modern cars have included for most of this century. Uh, blind spot detection has been added too, but only on the top prestige variants that very few customers will choose. Should you be put off by the fact that this car gets only three stars from a Euro NCAP testing system that awards most of its rivals a full five-star rating? Well, in one sense, no. The current NCAP test procedure only now awards five stars to cars crammed with pricey camera-driven safety kit that couldn't be incorporated into a duster unless it became much more expensive and featured a more modern set of basic underpinnings. The main thing is that the structure of this car is solid. Now, we were a little concerned to hear that in the full-width rigid barrier NCAP test, the duster didn't offer exemplary head protection for the driver, but the passenger compartment of this car remained solid stable when the NCAP organization put it through their frontal offset test, their side barrier test, and their side pole test. As a result, this statue was given a 71% NCAP score for adult occupants, 66% for child occupants, and 56% for pedestrians. 
What else? Well, across the range, you get rear ice fix charge seat fastenings for both outer rear seats, and they feature a seat belt pre tensioning and load limiting system. That's only just been fitted to the rear cabin of a Ford Fiesta. In addition, there are child locks in the rear doors and height adjustment for the front seat belts and headrest. Uh, plus, there's ABS braking with emergency brake assist for panic stops, which will be advertised to following motorists by high level uh, third rear brake light. And there's ESC, electric electronic stability control, ASR traction control, and HSA hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. You might have a couple of negative preconceptions here. One is that a decently capable SUV like this Duster will need to be solidly built, so heavier and therefore less economic than the class norm. The other might be the engine technology issue that often tends to apply to budget brand models, cars that frequently saddle you with an old nail beneath the bonnet that in terms of day-to-day -day running costs will lose you a lot of the money that you'd originally saved. Generally, we have good news to offer in both of these areas. Now, this Duster's curb weight uh, which in petrol two-wheel drive form is less than 1.2 tonnes, uh, isn't really much heavier than less capable segment competitors with more modern underpinnings, and that's a good start. As for the power plant issue, well, it isn't really an issue if you can afford the significant amount extra required for the diesel version of this car. Uh, the unit, that variant uses its badged blue DCI 115, but it's basically the same engine that you'll find used right across the Renault Empire, fitted to Dacia, Renault, Nissan, and even Infiniti models. Here it delivers 64.2 mpg on the combined cycle and 115 grams per kilometer of CO2. The same unit and a rival but pricier Renault Capture DCI 9 90 is only fractionally more efficient and will probably feel the opposite because the Renault has a slightly smaller fuel tank. Our report can't be quite so positive with regard to the petrol variant that we're trying here. Uh, at times in the previous Duster lineup, Dacia experimented with Renault's TCE petrol turbo engine technology and would hope that this might have been used in the Mark II model. As it is, this car has to persevere with an old tech, normally aspirated 115 HP, 1.6 litre SCE petrol power plant. Now true, this is a big improvement on the 105 HP petrol 1.6 that the original Duster was launched with, but it's still not particularly up to date compared with the engines used by modern rivals. So what does that mean in terms of returns? Well, for this front-driven model, uh, you're looking at 43.5 mpg on the combined cycle and 149 grams per kilometer of CO2. Switch to the 4x4 variant and those figures fall to 40.4 mpg and 158 grams per kilometer. Looking at the two-wheel drive model's figures, you're talking in rough terms of an efficiency showing that's about 10 miles per gallon and 25 grams per kilometer behind the class normal for this engine and drive format. Now, if your annual mileage isn't very high, and it won't be for most likely buyers, then this won't be too much of an issue. And of course, uh, with the money you're saving, this duster still works out to be an extremely cost-effective overall proposition indeed. Of course, you'll need to play your part at the wheel if you're gonna get anywhere near those official figures. Uh, you'll be helped in that if you get yourself a Comfort or Prestige spec derivative that's fitted with the MediaNav infotainment system, and that's thanks to the setup's Driving Eco 2 menu. Now, that offers a whole range of options to help improve your driving efficiency. A trip report section shows average consumption, average speed, and uh, somewhat less helpfully, distance traveled without consumption. Um, then then there's an eco scoring section which awards you star ratings for your efforts in terms of acceleration, gear shifting and anticipation. There's also an eco coaching section you can access to get driving efficiency tips, most of which seem to be based around congratulating you for efficient gear changing, steering and acceleration. Other tips are just plain confusing, uh, like uh, congratulations, you're taking full advantage of your car's inertia. Still trying to work out what that means. Easier to get your head around are the excellent residual values this dust is likely to achieve when the time comes to sell. Since the Dacia doesn't cost much in the first place, you're never going to lose much. Uh, industry experts reckon that after three years and 36,000 miles, this car will still be worth 55% of what you originally paid for it, which is class leading and as good, if not better, than you get from some premium brand models. Uh, then there's peace of mind. Reliability surveys Europe-wide have suggested that the build quality 
functionality and reliability of this car is every bit as good as the Romanians promise. To survive in markets like those in North Africa and South America, of course, this car was always going to have to be very stoutly built. On to the warranty. Dacia offers an industry standard three year, 60,000 mile guarantee from the showroom, backed up by three years or 60,000 miles of roadside assistance. Uh, for a further 400 pounds, you can extend the cover by two years, or for just over twice as much, you can up the period covered uh, to a Kia equaling seven years and 100,000 miles. Service intervals are every year or every 12,000 miles, and since most Renault dealers look after Dacia's too, you should never be too far from a specialist workshop. Also helps, there's a timing chain which lasts as long as the engine. Thatcher offers a choice of prepaid servicing schemes which cover you for either two years and 24,000 miles or three years and 36,000 miles. That only leaves insurance groupings. The petrol 1.6 SCE two-wheel drive model is rated at Group 9E in base access form, 10E in essential guise, and Group 11E if you go for comfort or prestige trim. For the petrol four-wheel drive model, it's a fraction more affordable, 9E for essential or prestige, and Group 10E for comfort spec. Uh, the DCI diesel is rated at Group 13E in essential form, and Group 14E in comfort and prestige trim. So here's the bottom line. New cars are often a lot more expensive than perhaps they need to be, especially in fashionable market sectors like those for small SUVs. It's a trend manufacturers try to justify with high technology, which is certainly very impressive, but which many buyers neither appreciate nor really want. Now these are the people being targeted here by a very clever package indeed, one that gives you almost everything you need and nothing that you don't. All the original version of this car really required was a bit of extra polish, which, sure enough, has been applied to this second generation model. Other things we'd change? Uh, well, there's too much carryover engineering for the duster to make the step forward in safety technology that we'd like to have seen here. And the budget pricing means the need for a continued use of a 1.6 litre SEE petrol engine, which is a bit off the pace in terms of efficiency. Otherwise, though, there's much to like in the way that this duster has evolved. The things it can't offer, cutting edge handling and a really sophisticated, soft touch, trendy cabin become irrelevant when you consider the asking price, a figure that in 4x4 models buys you off-road ability that betters that of some rivals costing nearly twice as much. And in whatever guise you choose, you'll find a duster now smartly styled, practically finished and in diesel form affordable to run. Enough to make it a better bet than a late, low mileage, second hand SUV rival? Many will think so. All of which begs the question, will you be one of those who constantly pays over the odds for a car of this kind, justifying your purchase with vague notions of brand loyalty and high technology? Or, as Dacia suggests, how we reach the point where it's time to take a different, more realistic approach? It's a convincing argument.